So Holly Rebeck Cole is the coordinator for the Globe Observer, a project which aims to extend the longstanding citizen science program, Global Learning and Observations to Benefit the Environment, otherwise known as GLOBE, to non-school-based audiences. Prior to her current role, she was the Education and Communication Lead for the Earth Science Division at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. Previous to that, Holly was a science writer for NASA's Earth Observatory and led education and public outreach efforts for NASA's Terra and Landsat missions. Holly has a graduate degree in science communication from the University of Washington and an undergraduate degree in physics from Idaho State University. Kristen Weaver is the deputy coordinator for Globe Observer. She is also an outreach specialist for the Global Precipitation Measurement Mission based out of NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. Prior to that, she taught middle school science for eight years. Yay, I love teachers in both Montgomery County Public Schools in Maryland and the Denver Public Schools in Colorado, with a primary, primary focus on earth science. She holds an MA in education and a BS in computer science and psychology, both from the University of Denver. Please welcome Holly and Kristen. Okay, um, so let me, first of all, glad to be here this evening. Happy to talk to you about Globe Observer and what we've got going for the eclipse. Let me get my screen shared here. So yes, yeah, so um, as, as we were introduced, we are the coordinator and deputy coordinator for Globe Observer, which um, has more to it than just clouds and eclipse, but that's what we're going to talk about for this evening. Um, and so I'll just go ahead and get started. And um, I don't know, um, Brian or Vivian, if, if I'm happy to have questions um, in the middle if people have questions, but I'm not sure I will be able to see how easily I'll see the questions. So um, feel free to, uh, to interrupt if there are questions in the okay. middle that come up. Yeah, we'll moderate that for you. Perfect. Okay. And Holly and I are going to kind of tag team um, just here and there and kind of split up some of this uh, as we go along. So um, as was mentioned, this is a project that we're doing in, uh, for the Eclipse specifically in, in combination between the GLOBE program and NASA. Um, and I, I just like this poster, I like putting it in presentations, that, that we want you for citizen science, we want you to help uh, collect data for us during the Eclipse. Um, and I'm here to tell you how you can do that. Hey, Kristen, I don't think we see your um, screen. Do you want to share your screen? It, so no, you I thought I did. Is everybody else seeing it and I'm yeah. just missing it? I have it. Oh. I will do it again. Does that, is that better, Vivian? There you go. Yeah. Got it. Thanks. Okay. I thought I had, but yeah, maybe not everyone was seeing it. Um, so uh, as mentioned, the GLOBE program is, is a citizen science project that has been around for more than 20 years. And actually, this is an older slide because it's now 117 countries. Um, and so what we are doing with Globe Observer is taking this really rich program that had training teachers with students to collect data and do the really hands-on science in all of these different areas, but actually um, now expanding it to new audiences, including just people who are interested in the citizen science data. And that's what makes it really exciting that we're taking the pieces of, Globe, of the GLOBE program that is really Bit, is a very um, you know rich resource and making it a little bit more um, accessible to 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 more people. For the eclipse specifically, we are looking. Our tagline here is "How cool is the eclipse?" Uh, because it is pretty cool in many senses. But the idea is to try to look at what happens to clouds and what happens to air and potentially surface temperature. Or we're fo focusing on air temperature but what happens when the eclipse occurs. And so this is more than just the, the, what happens during totality, this is what's happening during the whole process between you know, first contact and last contact. What, how much is the earth cooling? How is that affected at different percentages of totality, at different latitudes, at different you know, parts? Some, some, the, the eclipse in Oregon will be in the morning, the eclipse uh, you know, on the, the middle and, and east coast will be more in the afternoon, the totality portion. So we just really want to see, can we get a lot of data to help us look at patterns in 
what is happening during the eclipse in the atmosphere. And the other aspect of it is not just collecting data uh, that it has scientific value, both, I will say, for the, the we, have, we have a few NASA scientists who, who if, if they're caging it a little bit, but they're willing to look at our, they may use their, our data if we get enough of it and if it's good enough, but the other uh, audience is the GLOBE students. So we can help provide this, this amazing database of real data about a particular interesting event that then we hope that we will have lots of GLOBE students uh, looking at and analyzing and doing projects about as well. So we've kind of got multiple audiences um, that, we, that we want to use the data, but then also kind of the other goal of it is just having people be more aware of some of these atmospheric changes during the eclipse. So of course, it's an amazing, beautiful, awesome astronomical event. I have never seen a total solar eclipse myself, so I'm very much looking forward to it. But there, there are other things that are happening before and after that amazing two and a half minutes that we want people to be paying attention to. And one of the ways that we can uh, have people pay more attention is by having them ha do, have a task that they need to do. And that's what we're hoping that you may be willing to help us with. So there's so during the eclipse, normally in the, in the Globe Observer app, we have clouds and we also have uh, the mosquito habitat mapper, which I will mention, and I think I have one slide about just so that you know it's there, but it's not really related to this. But during the, uh, during the eclipse, we'll add air temperature special for that day. Um, so all you need is a simple thermometer, and I know that thermometer in the middle is in the sun and it shouldn't be, but it's kind of hard to get a good picture of a thermometer without it being in the sun. Uh, so <laughs> we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, and then, you know, for those who are interested, um, if you want to do surface temperature or other variables, Globe, the GLOBE database doesn't have a real way to enter wind data, so we didn't include that, although I know there is some interest in whether there is, uh, you know, a solar wind that uh, or a uh, wind that occurs with the eclipse and eclipse wind. Um, so we don't have that as like a formal protocol, but if people are interested in collecting other the, uh, the, some of that other information and putting it in the comments, then we'll also be um, trying to look at that. And the, um, I'll mention also what if you want to enter service temperature or some of these things into GLOBE, there is a way to do that um, uh, with online training. But through the app, it will just be clouds and air temperature. So this is what our app is going to look like. If you download Globe Observer today, you will see these three buttons. Um, there, the, the Eclipse one has a little like red triangle off the side that says that you know data collection isn't available available yet, and uh, just will direct you to our website. But once uh, on about the 18th, so we're giving people a few days to practice their observations and do air temperature before, the, like a few days before the eclipse. Uh, you will you will click on that and you will see uh, the the eclipse special mini app. And so uh, there's there's uh, the the triangle there gives you information when you first come in, you will see some basic information and we'll also, also ask you what type of thermometer you have. That's, we'll talk, I'll talk about that a little bit more later about some of the different types of thermometers. Uh, and um, then also some settings, whether you want notifications some things like that. You can always change that in the settings button in the middle there. And then you can, you can see a data table of your observations. So this particular example has three observations. Um, that one of the cool things that our app developers did is that little moon at the top will actually move closer and closer to the sun. This is, uh, I think that the numbers they have here aren't really particularly accurate in terms of where that moon is going to be because it should be a lot closer to the sun in this particular uh, in this this particular setup. But it will actually move um, when you're when you're using it during the eclipse. Um, you know, there's a time to your next observation. And then as you go, it'll create this uh, graph of air temperature that you can save on your phone, that you can share via social media, and then the, the, the graph will be stored, but the, more importantly, the data points will be sent into the GLOBE database. And so you can see here we've got our temperature being recorded, and it does have the ability to do Fahrenheit as well as Celsius since we are, in, you know, GLOBE normally prefers uh, Celsius measurements, but since we are in the U.S., we thought it would make it a little bit uh, more friendly for, for people to also have the Fahrenheit option. Um, and then you can see the cloud observations that are being, being made there as well. So different types of thermometers. Um, 
we are not being terribly picky to be perfectly honest because we want people to participate now this is a little bit more of a sophisticated audience so we expect you might have a more sophisticated thermometer but really we are not going to turn down anybody's data we are going to ask people what type of thermometer they have but part of the goal is that if we get enough people crowdsourcing the data, we may be able to, you know, weed out if there are some really big outliers that somebody's thermometer really isn't working. Um, but we didn't want, because it's also an engagement activity, we didn't want to be, it's terribly particular about what type of thermometer people were using. So of course we have guidelines, we have suggestions for, you know, get one that is at least, um, you know, uh, resolution of, of five degrees Celsius at least, you know, try to get a good one. But, you know, honestly, anything is okay for this purpose because it is, it is an attempt to get as many people engaged as well as collecting data that we can, that we can hopefully also, you know, um, use uh, and, and by getting enough data, we can, we can weed out any sort of problems that we notice. And so as you see, you know, I actually did test these, these, these instant read thermometers that you see here on the, the left and the right, and they do seem to actually, they were not that far off compared to some of these other more sophisticated thermometers when I did some, some testing of them, just, um, just taking them inside and outside to, to test how quickly they would respond. Uh, if you are looking for specific suggestions about thermometers, the GLOBE program has information about some, some particular some suppliers and things that you might be able to get of some of the, the companies that provide a lot of GLOBE equipment or, or separate sort of things. But really, you can also just go online and find various sorts of thermometers as well. Um, there is not, like I said, we're not, because the goal is also outreach, we're not being terribly particular about um, thermometers, although we will be able to I think tell those who have the, the, the more sophisticated thermometers and be more rely a little bit more on their data since they'll tell us what type of thermometer they have. So what we want to do is have you take air temperature measurements for two hours before and after the maximum eclipse or totality if you're, if you're at a, a cross the path of totality. Um, but so the other thing that's important, and I imagine many of this audience are planning to travel for the eclipse, but these are measurements that can be taken uh, whether you're experiencing a partial eclipse or a total eclipse, we do actually want that comparison data. And we're going two hours because that will actually go before first contact. So we really want to get this curve of temperature from before the, um, before the, the eclipse even starts and then after it ends. So what we're hoping is that people will, will take those measurements throughout that entire about four hour period. Um, but you know, you don't need it quite as often um, at the beginning and the end. So for that period of a half hour before and after totality or maximum eclipse, we want people to increase those measurements to every five minutes, but you know, trying to balance the, the burden of, um, uh, of asking people to make measurements enough measurements but not having it too onerous a task that they don't that they choose not to do it and if there is anybody that is interested in doing you know that has some kind of data logger and wants to enter data more often than that I can talk to you about that that's something that could be entered through um, the regular globe program with a little bit of online training and then we want people to actually practice the, a day or two before and maybe get some comparison data the day before the eclipse so like I said data collection will actually start to be available August 18th, so that's the Friday before, and so people can start taking some measurements before that, and you know, if possible, maybe we can get some comparison data, because one of the things that's challenging in looking at the effects of the eclipse is you have all these other weather variables that are involved. So, you know, if there's a cold front coming in, how do you, how do you separate out what the temperature drop is because of the cold front, and what is the temperature drop because of the eclipse? And so maybe by having, a, you know, more, comparison data, we'll see if we can uh, sort out some of those differences. Uh, a few things again, because I know this is a little bit more of a, a sophisticated audience. Um, we're not asking people to necessarily calibrate your, their thermometers, but it's certainly not a bad idea to do if you're willing to take that extra effort. So um, it's pretty simple to do. Um, prepare this crushed, um, crushed ice and water, make sure you have more ice than water, um, put the uh, thermometer in the ice bath and let it sit for a few minutes, about, about 10 minutes. And then if it's showing between point, 0 0.5 and, and um, negative to positive, uh, that's Celsius. I didn't do the conversion for Fahrenheit on this slide, I guess. But um, so, you know, you want it to be within that, that range of plus or minus half a degree. Um, and, if, and then that, that will show you that that's, that's 
a good thermometer to use. Again, we're not going to turn anybody down if they don't do a calibration, but it's certainly not a bad thing to do if you want the most accurate data. And again, for accuracy of measurements, I mean, GLOBE prefers that air temperature be done in the instrument box that you see on the left. But of course, people are traveling for the eclipse, so they're not likely to uh, be able to carry that instrument box along with them. Um, but still, measuring it in the shade um, or even your own shadow will help make those, those measurements a little bit more accurate. And so this is, I just want to show this, so this was me testing those thermometers. So I took them from my air-conditioned inside out to my very much not air-conditioned outside to just kind of see how quickly they, they would respond. Um, and mo most of them actually did, did uh, within a few minutes. I mean, that's another reason for having the five-minute time frame is that some of these thermometers are not necessarily going to, to change super quickly. Um, they do have a bit of an adjustment period to a new temperature. So really, five minutes is a pretty good time frame. And like I said, these seemed to work. Um, they, that, that even my really cheap uh, thermometer there on the right that was, I think, under $10 actually was, was not too far off compared to the more expensive, like, multi-day thermometer or my uh, Kestrel there. Kristen, we have a question that relates to what something that you just said, and it seems like a good time to bring this up. Brian asks, what are the chances of getting access to the app earlier? Three days isn't a lot of time, especially for, uh, like he mentions that he is, and a lot of other people will be traveling during that time and might want to have an opportunity to test it and make sure it works before they're having to get in the car and go. Yeah, so actually that's a, that's a very point, good point. Let me clarify that. So the app you can download anytime. The app is available now. Cloud observations are available now. You could start doing those you know, tomorrow if you wanted to. So once you have updated the app, it, then, then it will have everything you need to do the eclipse. It will be already downloaded. It's just that we don't have data collection available until right before the eclipse. And part of that is honestly because of the, the, the GLOBE program uh, wanted to make sure that we weren't letting, like this is, not, this is not as controlled of data as the GLOBE program usually has. They usually require for, for, for most of the aspects of data going into the GLOBE database, they want people to be trained, they want people to be doing a certain, certain steps using certain, you know, will have calibrated those tools, have used very specific ther thermometers. Mo many of these thermometers would not be acceptable for normal GLOBE measurements. So that's kind of the balancing act between we want to have this special event where people can, uh, but where we're not being as restrictive. So that's why we're just allowing it a few days before. But you are able to, and we actually encourage you to download the Globe Observer app, and then everything will be there, and then the data collection will just um, become, uh, it'll just kind of click on with, on a time, like a, a time set that, that, that then you'll be able to enter data. So hopefully that makes sense, is that the app you can download ahead of time, you can get it set up, you can get your, um, your account made and everything that you need to do, and then once you get there on the 18th, everything will already be on your phone that you need to make the observations. This is Holly. If I may encourage you to download the app ahead of time if you plan on participating in the experiment. Um, you, so w once you download the app, you need to register, and that registration process is just to confirm that you know, you, you have an actual email address that you are a real person, and, but it does take a little bit of time and a little bit of back and forth, you know, just a few minutes, but it still takes a little time. And if you are in an area that's really crowded and you don't have the best data access at your Eclipse site, it's probably a good idea to make sure that that is set up ahead of time. And then once it's set up on your phone and you are registered, you no longer need data access to use the app. You know, you will need data access eventually to send the data back to or to send you know all the temperature measurements and cloud measurements back to us, but during the eclipse itself, you will not need that access because we we know that that um, data will probably be somewhat limited. Thanks, Holly. That's a much clearer way of saying it. And that's actually something that is it is built into the app normally is that once you have the app on your phone, whether you're doing clouds or the eclipse measurements or the mosquito habitat mapper, once you have the app downloaded, you don't need a Wi-Fi connection. You don't need cellular data to do, to collect the data. Then you can go back and send it later on. So it's it's so it's so you're able to do it out in the field 
um, whether that's because it's a remote place or if that's because there are thousands of people all trying to use the cellular network and so there's no connection. This is an example of some data collected from um, a, an eclipse in 2001, and this is um, uh, Sten Odenwald at, at NASA Goddard didn't collect this data, but he that link at the bottom, he's put together some, some uh, information that has a bit more detail about some of the types of thermometers and some things like that, uh, as well as some, some insight into observations. But so this is, this is a, an example of what we're hoping that we can, we can get uh, for, for observations. And this is about, uh, not quite, I don't know, what, 12, 12 degrees? Thereabouts, about 12 degrees difference in um, in between the top temperature and the bottom temperature here. So this is, you know, hopefully we will get some nice curves like this for, from people collecting the data. And then I am going to pass it off to Holly to talk a little bit about clouds. Great, thank you, Kristen. It's really nice to be here, and it's good to see everybody. So thank you for having me, um, for having us. Um, so why observe clouds during an eclipse? Um, you're kind of hoping you don't see clouds during the eclipse. Um, this, this stems from, this idea stems from an experience that I had in 2005. I um, traveled to Turkey to watch the 2005 total solar eclipse there, and it was a really hot, clear, sunny day. So we're sitting on the beach waiting for this eclipse to get going and we have first contact and, and, you know, over a rather, you know, a long period of time, you know, the, the eclipse continues to progress and it starts to get really cold and we have a wind picking up because we're on the beach. And so we have the, you know, land ocean temperature difference. And so we have a wind picking up and, and as we get closer and closer to totality, we started to see really thin, um, ice clouds, thin high ice clouds forming kind of around the sun, which was a little disconcerting because we were really afraid that it would be blocked during totality. Um, but it was all part of the eclipse experience, this huge dip in temperature that made it go from uncomfortably warm to really cold. And, um, and then the cloud, cloud change. So, um, so the clouds are, are a really nice proxy for what's happening in the atmosphere and help us think about um, what we, what, what this relationship is between the sun and the energy we get from the sun and our, our weather and um, temperature and patterns here on the ground. So this um, slide is, is a series of uh, cloud images as we see them from NASA's perspective from space. And um, you see just, um, you know, we're, we're looking at clouds from above uh, using a variety of sensors, whether they're um, airborne based or, or satellite based. Go ahead and go to the next slide, please, Kristen. And for some reason, the presentation is freezing on my screen. So, oh, there, there we go. Okay. I wasn't getting all the slides before, but it seems like it's here now. So this is the Globe Observer cloud protocol inside the Globe Observer app. So when you download the app, you're going to get that screen that is on the left where you have, um, it will actually have the Eclipse app on, or Eclipse protocol on top, and then clouds and mosquito habitat mapper. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about what the cloud protocol is. And again, encourage you to download the app ahead of time and to practice using the cloud protocol way before the eclipse starts because it does take a little practice to get the hang of, of the cloud classification. So when you first download the app um, and first launch the cloud protocol, you will be giving a series of training slides to kind of help orient you. But as you go, you know, a few training slides are probably not going to give you the deep knowledge you need to you know, definitively classify clouds in each instance. And so, you know, if you have questions as you go, there's that little question mark down at the very bottom of your screen. And um, there's also, on the cloud page, you don't actually see it here, a little key. And those things will help give you a little bit more information. The key is particularly useful because it, it opens up a much more detailed description of different cloud types. So when you launch the app, um, it's going to automatically find your location for you and record the time 
and um, it will also have a little map and so you can look at the map and see if the location that it's getting from your phone is accurate. Um, the phone location isn't always accurate so we give people the ability to correct that. Um, so once you have that set, you go to, you know, you click next, the next screen it will ask you about um, the, how much of the sky is covered in clouds. You know, are we looking at just a few clouds? Are we looking at isolated clouds, 10 to 20% scattered, broken, or completely overcast? For your sake, I'm hoping that, you know, you're clicking that top button during the eclipse that you only have a few clouds. And then, um, there's a question in the chat about is the slide advancing? You should be looking at a screen that says Globe Observer Clouds at the top and it has images of um, different screens from the app at the moment. Is that what you're seeing? Yes, that's okay. what we're seeing. Good. Okay. Yes. So um, once you've classified the cloud type, we're going to ask you, or I'm sorry, the, the percent cloud cover, we're going to ask you a few additional questions about what you're seeing. So we'll ask you, what kind of cloud are you seeing? Are you seeing really high, thin clouds? Are you seeing, um, um, you know, the, the thicker cumulus, zero cumulus, high cumulus clouds, or the, the really high zero stratus clouds? And we break it down into different sections of the sky. So you have, um, your high-level clouds, your mid-level clouds, and your low-level clouds. And we just ask people to do their best to classify what they see. And if you don't know exactly what you see, don't worry about it too much. Um, because we will have you take pictures of the sky, um, which I will get to in a moment. So once you classify what kinds of clouds you see, we'll ask you what color is the sky. We're, we're asking that because we're trying to get at... Um, you know, what kind of, what is the air quality? Are, are there a lot of aerosols in the air? Things like smoke or dust. I think smoke could potentially be an issue for us in August. Um, or is it really clear? Is it deep blue? And then um, we're going to be looking at visibility. You know, can you see a long ways or is it really hazy and you can't see very far at all? And then once you've, you've kind of classified everything, um, using the keys that will show up on the app itself, we ask you to take pictures. And what the phone will do is it will tell you to rotate your phone so it's landscape um, sideways, and then it will ask you to tilt your phone up to 20 degrees, and it will, it will help you do that, and it will also help you face north, south, east, and west. And so as you rotate around, it will um, actually automatically take a picture when you get to north and you're tilting your phone 20 degrees, it will snap a picture of the sky. And this is, um, kind of a verification, if you will. You know, we can go back and see if the cirrus clouds you say are there are actually there, or maybe there's some additional things there that you didn't perhaps notice. Um, it's also uh, useful for scientists to compare actual photos to some of the satellite data. So that is what the cloud app will have you do. Again, the training is in the app itself with links to additional material. Um, through both the help button and the, um, suddenly things are changing. <laughs> um, can I just go ahead and go to the next screen? So anyway, you, you do have help in the app and we just ask you to do your best. So next slide, please, Kristen. I'm still seeing globe observer clouds. There we go. There we go. What can clouds tell us? Should be what you're seeing now. So why monitor clouds? Well, as I mentioned, it's a proxy for what's going on in the atmosphere. They can tell us about air temperature and water and wind high in the sky. So for example, in that top um, left picture, you're seeing a airplane contrail, and it's a really short-lived, short airplane contrail. And if you see that, and the rest of the sky is fairly clear, you know it's probably pretty dry up in the atmosphere because that contrail is forming and there's not enough moisture, it's, the, it's all evaporating away very quickly. Whereas the um, photo on the right, top right, is showing a moist atmosphere where um, you know, there's enough moisture in the atmosphere that things are not um, evaporating away and the clouds are persisting a little bit longer. So it's telling us a little bit about you know, dry, the humidity of that level of the atmosphere. But also it also tells us, um, you know, if you have 
really cold icy clouds then it's a, it, the atmosphere is getting cool very quickly um, whereas if you have um, some of the the big cumulus clouds it's um, perhaps not quite as cold or freezing quite as much so it tells you a little bit about temperature and um, winds and humidity it also tells us how much um, sunlight is reaching the ground and how much heat is escaping back into space and this is actually why NASA is particularly interested in cloud data not just during the eclipse but you know generally um, it helps us to understand the balance between energy coming from the Sun energy leaving the earth and how what that actually forms our climate Can you go ahead and go to the next slide please Kristen so you should be seeing a slide that says cloud effects on Earth's radiation and with lots of arrows and so the yellow arrows t are referencing um, energy coming in from the Sun and it comes to the surface of the, our planet and it heats Earth and that um, um, the heat goes up as outgoing long-wave radiation which is represented by the, the red arrows so different kinds of clouds interact with this energy both incoming and outgoing in different ways high clouds tend to be kind of thin and, and transparent so they let that light through and to reach the ground but they tend to trap heat so if you have a lot of high clouds you're going to have some heat trapping properties because um, they let more in than they let out um, the low clouds are thick and so they reflect that incoming radiation back out into space which tends to have somewhat of a cooling effect broadly speaking um, but they also um, reflect quite a lot of the they let about half of the um, outgoing heat back out into the atmosphere and they radiate half back down to the to the surface so that's why on a, on a winter's day when you have a cloudy sky it's a little bit warmer than when you have a really clear sky um, the energy is is coming back from those clouds so they have a, a different effect on the energy budget and where this energy goes so by knowing where all the clouds are on earth and seeing how the different cloud types change helps us understand all of the pieces of, of where this energy is going when it comes here from the sun and what it's doing in the atmosphere and then what happens is it is it leaves earth um, next slide please so this is just um, very quickly this is the the NASA fleet of satellites and the satellites that are circled are those that have specific um, instruments designed to observe clouds go ahead and go to the next slide so why do we need citizen scientists if we have all of these instruments that observe clouds well citizen scientists can provide us some unique data that help us understand that satellite data a little bit better so um, it gets us global data points in areas that we that scientists themselves would not be able to go to but it also provides us the bottom-up perspective you know satellites looking down from space um, but we can see unique things looking up um, go ahead and go to the next slide so um, this is a couple of examples um, we can identify certain aspects of clouds that, that sensors might not be able to see. We might be able to see details in the clouds, like the rainbow you see here, or some of the smaller clouds that might otherwise blend in when you look at it at the coarser satellite view. So a human observer can tease out some of those details. We also see small features that are just too little to be observed um, from the satellites that we use to observe clouds and that are too short-lived. Most of our satellites are in a polar orbit, which means that they go over a spot on Earth, you know, once a day, twice a day, once during the day and once during night. And that means, you know, we're only looking at that area for maybe five minutes, 10 minutes during the day. And so these short lived clouds that kind of change throughout the day, we're going to miss them. So an observer from the ground is that we're going to see that, whereas our satellites might miss it. I've also seen examples of of some of the photos that people have submitted to us through the Globe Observer app where they've uh, noted some contrails and um, you see the contrails very clearly in the photos when you go back and look at the satellite data it just isn't showing up it's just too little next slide please so the other reason that citizen scientists um, and the ground perspective is really useful is that you can see um, 
cloud that we might have a tough time seeing from a satellite. So in the right hand image, it's the view from the top looking down. And you see in that scene, there are clouds there, but there's also a snow covered landscape. And it's really tough to differentiate the two. You can kind of tell because they're slightly different textures, but it's tough. And we could look at other wavelengths of light and tease it out that way, but um, the view from, you know, looking down, from the ground looking up, you have then really nice contrast with the sky and the cloud. So you can tell the difference between sky and cloud pretty easily. And so um, just having that additional data point is helpful for our scientists in, in knowing where the edges of clouds are and what's cloud versus land cover. Okay, next slide. So during the eclipse, we're asking people to make the observations every 15 to 30 minutes, more often if you see changes happening. Um, if you're also measuring air temperature, the um, you'll get a reminder in the app. You know, every every third time you enter an air temperature observation, to to think about maybe making a cloud observation as well. And then you also have um, through the app itself um, in the photo fields, you have you can add narrative comments to your photos about anything interesting you see happening. So um, you see a cloud maybe forming or dissipating very quickly. Um, yes, please remember to turn on your, your, your phone location or else the app's just not going to be able to get that for you. Thank you for that in the comments. Um, so anyway, you can add narrative uh, and additional information for us to complete the story of your experience. Next slide. Still not advancing. Maybe try again. I think there's just a delay because I, I advance it and then I don't think you can see it right away for whatever reason. No, I'm still looking at cloud measurements. There we go. So um, some of you may be leading outreach events or activities. And so um, we wanted to suggest maybe some things that you could do and maybe not the day of the eclipse or possibly the day of the eclipse, depending on what there is going on around you. Um, and one activity that I think that I plan on using when I do outreach events in, in Idaho is the cloud in the bottle. And with this activity, you're going to be changing the pressure inside the bottle, which will raise the air temperature in the bottle. And then um, you'll release the you know, you'll, you'll increase the pressure and then release the pressure. And as you release the pressure, the temperature in the bottle is going to decrease and you should get kind of a, a cloud <laughs> in, in quotation marks to form. And so you can talk about why we might see changes in the atmosphere and changes in clouds during an eclipse if we have temperature changes in the atmosphere, similar to the temperature changes we're going to be experiencing in the bottle. So if you haven't done this, this activity before, there are lots of examples on YouTube. Um, so you know, I encourage you to take a look at it in action, but really quickly, um, you'll just pour um, just a little, a little water bottle works really well. A very flexible water bottle works very well. You know, pour just a little bit of water, warm water in the bottom of the bottle, just enough to cover it, swirl it around to coat the sides of the, the container. And then you light a match and put the match inside the bottle. I always caution if you're leading the event, you're the only one holding that match. I don't, don't ever hand them to anybody, um, particularly if you're outdoors in a fire prone area. Um, so you're going to put that match in the bottle. Um, it will go out and then you'll put the cap on the bottle very quickly and tightly. We want, what we want is the smoke coming off that, um, off that match. So you want to trap that inside the bottle. So you're going to squeeze that bottle really hard for a few seconds, you know, have a kid squeeze it or, um, a, a kid and parent squeeze it for and count to 10 and then release it. And you should, when you release the bottle, you're again, decreasing that pressure. And so the temperature will decrease and you should see a cloud form. Next slide. So I know the next slide while um, Kristen is, well, it's, we're waiting for it to show up. Um, that next slide is going to tell you a few variations on the cloud in the bottle activity. Um, one of them is to, instead of water, to put alcohol in the bottle. In this case, do not use the match. You're just going to increase pressure and then release the pressure. And the, since the um, evaporation point for alcohol is much lower, um, you don't need the, 
condensation nuclei that the smoke will provide. It's just a way to do this without a match. It also produces a much thicker cloud. So uh, if you're working with a large group, it's, it's, um, it's, it's an easier one to use. So you can use rubbing alcohol without a match. Um, and uh, when you do that, I, I think it's a good idea, especially if you're using both to um, color the alcohol so you don't risk putting the match in there. So another thing you can do is instead of squeezing the bottle, you can use a bike pump uh, with, a, with a, a sealed cork um, on the bottle um, to increase the pressure. And then you can just well, pull the cork out to release it. Um, or you can use a fizz keeper to do the same thing. Um, you can put an aquarium thermometer inside the bottle so you can see the increase in temperature as you increase the pressure. Yeah, <laughs> rubbing alcohol with a match would be a different physics demonstration. I don't think any of us want that. Um, and let's see. And then um, the last one is that you can shine a laser through the bottle to just emphasize the clouds forming in the bottle. And again, this is just a nice way to talk about changes in pressure and temperature, things that we expect to see during the eclipse and why that would uh, result in cloud changes. All right, Kristen, I think it's yours. And I see the next slide. Yeah, so that delay is really weird. I don't know why it's doing that. But so again, just to continue with some other things that you can, um, that you can, uh, th th some ideas you might think about for table demonstrations or things like that. And by the way, we are not talking about any of the eclipse like as astronomy eclipse uh, activities because there are so many resources out there on um, the Ecl NASA Eclipse website, eclipse2017.nasa.gov. I mean, lots of other people have done uh, eclipse uh, demonstrations with, you know, the, the, the ball and the, the, the light and all that sort of thing. This is just some things related to the cloud specifically. Um, so this is one, and I'm sorry, I forgot to put a link at the bottom of this, but I can, I can make sure I paste it into the chat later on. Um, but so this is something you can print out, and it's uh, the idea of looking at sky conditions and some of the, the reasons why the sky appears different colors based on what's in the atmosphere. And so if you put a little cup on each of these and then put water in the cup and then add some, some drops of milk, you know, none on the left, and then in steadily increasing drops of milk on the right, then you can actually see that that's why the, um, the, the, the sky is becoming more hazy is because of these added aerosols, these added bits of particles, in this case represented by the milk and, you know, in nature represented by, you know, various dust particles or other pollutants or even water vapor on a more humid day, you might have it be a little bit less blue. Uh, and so you can look at this. So this relates to these, the observations that we have people do because you're both looking down through the top of the cup or the bottle, whatever you use, and seeing that's kind of like when you were looking up at the sky and seeing that different sky color, but also then looking across the horizon, you can put something behind the, the cups and look, look through it to see how those differences are going to affect how the horizon appears. And so this is just a, a way to show that in a very controlled setting of why, why the sky is not always the same color blue. Uh, also looking at um, cloud transparency. So this is um, uh, an, I, an activity that you can have people do. Um, and I, again, I should have had the link at the bottom of this, but the idea is that you give people different materials. Um, and this could be certainly a, 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 like a, a, an activity for, for kids and working at, at for half an hour, or it could be just something at a table where you give people some tissue paper and some paper towels and some white paper and some cardboard or maybe some foil or you know whatever different types of materials you have and have them sort it into transparent translucent and opaque which are the categories we put the clouds in uh, and so you can have them start to think about well how do i actually determine this do i hold it up at a at, through a light do i try to see something through it do i shine a light through it like how can you actually uh, determine what, what category these are that we also then have for the clouds and of course make such a big difference in terms of how much energy is getting through those clouds. And so it's a way to make it, make it hands-on, especially, I mean, these are especially suited for kids, although I think, you know, adults, I've done that with teachers and they seem to enjoy themselves as well, but especially for kids to think about what are the differences between these things and something tangible that then they can connect to their, their, their observations looking up at the clouds. 
Um, this is one that I've done. This is not related to the eclipse, but you know, you can also just, if you're measuring temperatures at a location, have a whiteboard or a piece of paper. Um, this was looking at, at air temperature versus surface temperature, um, and then the clouds observations uh, for the eclipse, you may not, you may want to limit it to just air and clouds, but keep something like a running total as, as things are happening. So it's not, uh, so it's not just in the app, but also something visible that if you've got a big event, if you're running a big event, you can can also then have people seeing something uh, as, as it's changing and kind of contributing to, to, uh, to a group activity. Um, this is our um, Eclipse website on Globe Observer. So a lot of the things that we've talked about are here. Uh, we are constantly updating it and adding new things as we think of new things that would be useful, new information that people uh, would be useful for people to have. So um, this, um, please visit this website um, and, and to find all of the information. Uh, this is also where if you download the app now, before data collection is available, it will take you to this page when you click on the Eclipse button. Wanted to talk a little bit about some of the past eclipse and some of the, especially one fairly recently that was that was uh, had some citizen science data collection that I think that we can surpass with uh, Eclipse 2017. Uh, so these are the the last eclipse that went across the the, the United States fully in uh, 1918. Um, and then the last one in the United States, these were some fun maps that were on one of the NASA websites that I think are show um, what um, what those past eclipses, where they went compared to where the current one is. But so this is the one where there was actually uh, this, uh, this eclipse that was partial in the United Kingdom, but they actually did, uh, there were a few different papers that were published in this Philosophical Transactions A of the Royal Society about, among other things, the National Eclipse Weather Experiment, which incorporated citizen science data. Uh, and so what they, uh, what they did is they collected, they collected uh, air temperature, they collected clouds, although only four categories uh, from clear to somewhat cloudy, mostly cloudy to completely overcast. So not the level of detail that we're collecting. They also had people observe wind, not with an anemometer, but just doing the Beaufort scale and, and observations of, of, of signs they could see of the wind as well as wind direction. Um, and so this is one that I think we can much surpass because here is our eclipse 2017 and there is the the geographic size of Great Britain there and look how much more first of all we're getting a total solar eclipse whereas they were only getting the partial part of the eclipse I think it was 85 to 95 percent depending on where in the UK you were and then also we have a lot more people in that path so I think that we can we could manage to collect a whole lot more data and see if we can we can match some of their observations um, this is one of the, the papers that they put out about it, um, actually assessing those citizen science weather observations. And you can see here, they also had kind of a similar twofold goal to provide this dense network of observations, but also as a public engagement activity, because trying to get people involved in doing science rather than just being a little bit more passive and observing. So they did find, you know, these are some of their observations. This was also, uh, the, the totality was in the morning, I believe. So we're, we're a little bit more middle to the later afternoon. We'll see if that makes a difference. So we've got some, so that's the, the, the absolute temperature. Uh, and then also the anomaly. Clearly they did see an anomaly. In this case, it looks like only, only about three degrees drop. Um, but again, that was only partial, so we'll, I, I expect that we will be able to see more of a drop in temperature during um, observations collected uh, next month. Uh, and then they did also, like I said, look at clouds, although they're, 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 um, you see there are four categories, just clear sky, mostly clear, mostly cloudy, and overcast. So we will have a lot more detail in terms of do we see different types of clouds forming, do we see, um, or, or what other changes do we, do we notice? Um, one thing that I will mention for those who are um, who would like to go a little through some online training and we have information about that on our Globe Observer website if you go up to training and, and clouds um, if you would like to be able to collect data more often than the app will allow you more often that five or ten minutes if you have some kind of data logger or weather station if you want to be able to officially send in surface temperature or some of the other measurements that 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 Globe does allow, but we're not focusing on, um, then you can, if you go through that online training, there is also a data entry mobile app 
that you could then add, also add those data, or you could collect the data during the eclipse and then go back to your computer later and send it in. So if there, if there, if anybody is interested in doing that, there is information on our website, or of course you can also contact us via the observer.globe.gov contact us form, and I'm happy to send you additional information if you if you really want to go gung ho and collect more than just air temperature and clouds. Um, and then I had some things about satellite overpasses and checking those, but I'm looking at the time and I'm wondering if I should just stop there, Brian. Yeah, we have a few questions and there's some other questions that might come up as we go. And so, but that's really good there. You know, I guess it just is a testament to the flexibility of the app and the amount of information that um, really goes into having a more complete record of what's going on out, out there in the environment. Let me jump then to the last slide, which has our um, website information, and then we can do questions. All right, well, we could leave that up there for uh, just a, a moment. Um, we had a question a while ago from Joe, and I think that this is a, a good place to mention this one. Uh, he notes that he signed up for the app, but he didn't receive a password. And so kind of what's the protocol about what goes on when you actually sign up for it and uh, passwords and then actually make it so that you can use it? So it should, uh, if you've signed up for it, it should automatically send you a password. If it did not do so, um, please just send us, uh, there's the, on our website, there's a, there's a help email and we can see what happens with that. It usually ha sends the password pretty quickly, but I think there are some isolated incidents where for whatever reason it didn't work properly. Um, and so uh, if you just go to observer.globe.gov and the, the help at the bottom and contact us if you don't get the password and we'll sort it out. Right, the password will be in your email, the email address that you gave us. So yeah, check your spam folder, make sure it doesn't get tucked away, junk folder, whatever you use. Okay, well, um, Shoshana, we haven't forgotten about you. I'll get to your question in just uh, half a moment here. Uh, Brian asks, will it be possible to and useful to enter temperature data from multiple thermometers in the same location? That's an interesting question. You know, I think because of the way, well, that is an interesting question. Um, I'm trying to remember if, if we have multiple measurements from the exact same location, if the app will even take it. Yeah, That's if it's too error. close together to the same location, it may overwrite it. So what you may, if you have multiple thermometers, you may just try to check and see which one is the best calibrated and which one has the best um, a reaction time. So, you know, for example, taking it from a warm temperature to a cool temperature or vice versa and seeing which one, uh, which one equilibrates and gets to the new temperature the fastest. And I would say just choose your, what you think is whichever thermometer is best. Although there's part of me that says, ooh, that would be interesting. Maybe that you, you could do some some own of your even if it doesn't even if it doesn't work to submit it to the app, you could do some interesting uh, tests to see on your on your own whether what changes that affects. But um, if you wanted to do that, you're gonna have yeah. to each thermometer would be assigned to a different user because the app will only record temperature from one person and you don't want to mix instruments yeah. in the app since it's looking at change over time. You don't wanna throw in two different thermometers. Oh, I was just thinking of like recording it on paper and seeing if there's no, a I understand. Like, pick, yeah, report your, whatever your best thermometer is, report that. But you know, for me, I would probably write it down and then do a graph later and see if I noticed a difference. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think that Shoshana was quite intrigued when you have the different um, uh, functions within the app. Um, I'm guessing that she noticed that one of them is, has to do with mosquitoes. And so she was hoping that you would uh, say something about mosquitoes. And then I was thinking about this, you know, that might actually be applicable. Mosquitoes might change their behavior during the eclipse. That, that's an interesting thought. I'm, I, think, I think, do I have the mosquitoes? I have the mosquitoes right before. I can talk about this a little bit. 
Um, what we are looking at with the mosquitoes is not actually like the adult mosquitoes and what they're doing. It's actually their mosquito habitats. So I would not expect there to be any eclipse effect on because if this is going to be more related to, to rainfall and, and vegetation and some other, other things. But if you are interested in this one, um, this is in the app now, and the basic idea is that you go and look for a standing water somewhere there, where there could be mosquitoes, um, identify the type of habitat it is, um, look and see, do you see any larva in that, in, in that container or pond or whatever it is, and um, if you'd like to, you can actually like take a cup or a, a syringe, like a, a turkey baster, and actually sample and see and count the larva. If you want to get this, um, like a little clip-on thermometer, or not thermometer, I've got thermometers on the brain, a clip-on magnifier, you can actually, we do have a key that will go through and help you identify um, some of certain types, not, it's not, comprehensive it's focusing on certain ones that are disease carrying mosquitoes but so this is something that the the app steps you through trying to identify what type of mosquito it is a mosquito larvae that you see we do focus on the larvae not the adult mosquitoes although there may be adult mosquitoes around you should absolutely you know use bug spray long sleeves but you can't get the diseases from the, the larvae we're just but you can know what types where they're spreading where the mosquito habitats are so probably not at all related to the eclipse but kind of a cool thing to do and those little magnifiers are pretty awesome <laughs> that is pretty cool okay so kevin asks he had seen that the atmosphere class was being offered in fayetteville i guess that's how it's pronounced over the next couple of days, it states that uh, the audience is for teachers, and he's wondering if uh, they can sign up for classes to become globe teachers. And so I guess, you know, what's the, um, the breadth of people that you can accept into uh, these classes? Can, you know, amateur astronomers uh, or uh, informal educators participate as well? Sure. So um, that is up to the person who's running the class. You know that whoever's whoever the trainer is they may be looking to build a teacher network and may only choose to accept teachers into the course however the program broadly is looking for citizen scientists and encouraging people to take the training whether it's online or in person and so um, we're we're trying to make that accessible to as many people as possible so I encourage you to go ahead and get in touch with whoever's giving that course and ask them if you can sign up for it and you know, tell them you're a citizen scientist, you want to participate as a citizen scientist and, and just see if they have space to let you in. Um, we definitely want you to participate and provide data. So, And JJ kind of has a more general question and I'm guessing that uh, this has to do with kind of the, the whole thing about being a citizen science. scientist is basically an opportunity to volunteer and so that's really kind of correct here isn't it that's right that's what we that's what we need we need people to volunteer to uh, collect data and send it in to us from all the places that we cannot be particularly scientifically minded people like this community okay. well why don't you go ahead and uh, stop screen sharing and we had a couple of other uh, comments and uh, a question that's kind of outside the scope of this webinar. And so we're not gonna be able to get to those. Um, but I do want to thank Kristen and Holly for uh, uh, coming and uh, sharing with us. This is really fascinating. I put a link in there. I think that I'm not sure if it was one of you two or one of your colleagues. Uh, I think it was actually Lynn who uh, presented about the Globe Explorer, uh, Globe Observer app to uh, a workshop that we did with the NISE network uh, this last spring. And there are some very nice videos about the, um, the bottle with the alcohol and some other information on, uh, I put the link in there and it's up a little bit, uh, the NISENet.org exploring earth investigating clouds. And so there's a few more links to some activities that you potentially could use in your outreach activities there. And that's all for tonight. And so in a few days, I'm sorry, what? Don't wait. Before we go, don't forget the giveaway. Oh, we're not there yet. We're, we're <laughs> okay. I know, it's, um, it's right here. We're not going anywhere. Okay. Uh, so you'll be able to find this webinar along with many others on the Next Sky Network website in the Outreach Resources section. Each webinar's page also features additional resources and activities. And we'll post some of these <laughs> things there as well. And you'll also be able to find this presentation on the Night Sky Network's YouTube channel. Uh, 